Okay, all right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So uh, we talked about some fundamental aspects of circuit design. Now it's the second part of this uh, let's say event, this kind of novice day, and we are going to look at some of the applications for circuit design. So some of the most let's say important applications from the point of view of day-to-day -day life, and also some emerging applications as quantum computation. So let me first of all uh, invite okay our next speaker. So Sarah Pellegrini, ST Microelectronics, and uh, Sarah will be talking about uh, sensors. So just a few words about Sarah's background and experience. So she uh, graduated with a degree of uh, electronic engineering from Polytechnica di Milano and a PhD in physics from Harriet Walsh University. So Sarah now is uh, Sarah is uh, Imaging Communication Manager and Academic Collaborations and PhD uh, Portfolio Manager within the uh, Analog MEMS and Sensor Groups at ST Microelectronics. Mm -hmm. So Sarah holds several patents and offered papers and conference communications on uh, single photon avalanche diet and single Fulton Avalanche diet systems and applications. So welcome, Sarah. Hello, good afternoon, everybody. I have the tough job of keeping you awake for the post-lunch uh, session, so bear with me. Um, I will go through a little bit of my career path because uh, I'd like to think that you know there's many ways to get to your dream job and uh, and since you know you're quite young still at the in, you know during your studies I think it's important to see that you know once you have an idea you should follow it and then uh, I will introduce some sensors then I will really zoom into the lidar pixel and uh, talk about lidar architectures and the future which is where you come in so. The very beginning, well, <laughs> in Bergamo, I started as a primary, uh, as a ballet dancer, but then um, I first saw my, I know, I see my first circuit when I was in high school, and uh, as uh, Adi was saying, you know, it was like that. So it was very visible, very simple, very small, very few pieces, and I fell in love with it. I thought, oh, this is great, you know, that's what I want to do for my life. And so I went all the way to Milano and joined the, the electronics uh, engineering degree, and uh, I did a degree in microelectronics and optoelectronics. And, uh, and here I saw something else which was fantastic, and it was, uh, you know, the construction of a moss in, uh, you know, in silicon. And again, I thought, oh, this is the best thing in the world. Um, analog design was okay, but you know, really, this was what was grabbing me. You know, I wasn't really one of those that was interested by the big circuit of an amplifier. Um, so then I took a, a longer step, an even further step. I flew all the way to Edinburgh and started my uh, PhD at Harriet Watt University. And in this one, I started building towards my dream, really. And I did work, uh, I did my PhD on Inga indium phosphide single photon avalanche diodes. And I was really working closely with the people building, you know, uh, growing these materials, designing the chip. I, I was designing the chip, and then I was doing all the characterization of it. And I remember spending hours and hours in the clean room uh, trying to, to make these devices. And I really loved also the characterization aspect. You know, you, you have to come up with solutions and ideas every time, and intuitions are very important there. And then I was also part, you know, like, uh, uh, of, uh, you know, I was working also as a coordinator of the youth project, and that's where, you know, eventually my career is now, you know, it's more about collaborating with external companies and so on. But basically, at some point after this, I decided to go and work for ST. Now, this is a little bit of a marketing slide, but, you know, it's about ST. I mean, who, what is ST Microelectronics? It's actually one of the biggest uh, semiconductor companies in the world. And we have uh, over 50,000 50, employees and quite a large amount in R&D. So that's where I, where I work in. And uh, what we also have, which is very important, is the manufacturing of the silicon. So we can make new devices and create new, new processes and, and have new ideas really developed for us. And so as I say here, you know, we have a lot of manufacturing and mainly it's in Europe. Uh, there's, a lot, there's France and Italy are the, the biggest sites, but we also have some manufacturing here in Singapore. But basically, uh, now what, am, what is my job? You know, I thought uh, for you now, you know, I said I've, uh, I've achieved my goal with my career. Yes, I did. So I am an advanced SPAD pixel architect, or I was until, you know, a few months ago. 
And, uh, and also, okay, I, devint, I became a pixel manager or a team manager. And I always liked uh, coordinating uh, all our uh, students and so on. So I was, I was, as I've always been um, looking after our imaging PhD students. We have a big, strong um, program where we have a lot of students coming in. At the moment, we have 38 students working on imaging topics in ST. So, and what does it mean? I mean, uh, talk about that, but you know, basically, uh, being a pixel architect means having to deal with a lot of people to develop that pixel. So at the beginning, I was doing it as a PhD student by myself, you know, in a, in a lab with a, okay, a supervisor and so on. But then, you know, when you're working in a company, actually, you have to do that with the uh, teams. You know, there's teams that do all the different uh, functions for you. And uh, so working together, we had a pixel design team, simulation team, uh, an optoelectronic characterization team. So, you know, there's a big group of people that have to work together across sites, across uh, different organizations. So it's, it's where, you know, the pixel architect comes into place. You know, again, this level of collaboration. So then, as I said, you know, in Edinburgh, I also manage the pixel team and the, all the students. And I'm also a very strong, you know, believer in STEM outreach. So I really think that we need to go and talk to our young children to tell them that electronics is fun. Electronics is actually feasible and it's fun. Touching components, you know, I love uh, snap circuit components because touching them, being able to put wires together is great. It's brilliant. And, uh, and then, okay, so, you know, as an interface outside, I do all this other stuff that is about, uh, you know, going out and talk to people, go to conferences and be part of uh, those technical committee uh, that uh, uh, organize these beautiful events like today. And also for uh, the people here, I'm also a mother, right? And it's not a small challenge. Okay, I thought I wanted to put this in because, in fact, I had two daughters two years apart, and that means that I took maternity leave. So I, had, I took some time off, but that did not compromise my my development, you know, my, my success, you know, inside ST, I still managed to, you know, be there at the right time when we started working on this pixel, which I'll introduce later. You know, I was the right person in the right place, and I got to, to really uh, progress in that, in that way. So you can still, you know, if you want to become a mother, you can still do it even if you do electronics. So don't give up that because of, you know, some other things that you want to do in your life. So. Let's go back to us. So I, I, I said I would talk about sensors, so let's, go, let's get to it. So what are they used for? And uh, we'll see. So I would like to ask you, you know, to tell me how many sensors are in an iPhone. So if you look at one of these, actually, I've got some numbers for the latest uh, iPhone sensor. How many do you think? Give me a number. Somebody? Like 11. Like 11, OK. Any other? Somebody daring? Somebody. 100, OK. OK, well, I'll tell you. There are total number of type, nine type of sensors, OK? And actually, very close, very close. Well done. 100 was a bit excessive. But uh, so we have two types, actually. You know, I, I put them into categories. So the first one is MEM sensors. And we have a barometer, so to estimate the altitude. You know, we all use it when we go walking or something. Uh, there is a three-axis gyroscope which is, uh, you know, to tell you how you're holding your screen, so it, uh, it uh, turns it. We have an accelerometer, which is, again, uh, it's all about screen orientation here. It's a bit boring. Uh, and then you have a magnetometer, okay, that's for your compass, you know, GPS. Uh, we all know that. And then we also have a moisture sensor. You know, nowadays, they, you know, everybody drops a phone in their toilet, apparently, so you need to have this. So, um, but we also have optical sensors, which is where I come in, obviously. Uh, so we have a proximity sensor, which is what, uh, you know, tells the user, the, the phone that, you know, somebody uh, is picking it up and um, putting it near the head, and so it turns the screen off, okay? So that's what that does. Then we have an ambient light sensor, and this is used both for the screen brightness and also to adjust the white balance of your uh, cameras. Okay, so there are two of them which are which are do a very important job. Then there is the touch ID. Obviously, it's a, it's a well, it's like a mouse, more pretty much. Then there's a face ID. Now you've seen that now it's what comes with all the iPhone, basically, pretty much. And then there's cameras, right? Now I put that. It's the only one in plural, if you notice. And actually, 
there are quite a lot of cameras in a mobile phone. So there's two at the front, which you don't see. But if you look properly, you know, you see that there are some kind of sparkling little things. And one is a, a 1.4 megapixel, another one is a 12 megapixel. And then there's rare cameras. I mean, okay, mine is a bit old, so it's only got two. But now there's a, a telephoto camera, a main rare camera, an ultra wide camera, and a LiDAR, right? It's now starting to exist in, uh, in uh, Apple, in iPhones. And so the total really is 14, right? That's a large number. But now let's go to something a bit bigger, a car. Now, same question. You know, considering there are 14 in a phone, then how many do you think there are in a car? In a, car? a much more complex system, so. Try somebody else in the audience. What? 30. 30? Anybody? What? 50. 50? Okay, well, there's more than 60. There's sensors everywhere in a car, right? We don't see them, but you know, you, you have this light turning on when you, when you switch your, your key. But there's loads of them. Massive. I'm not going to go through them. I mean, there's, I don't even know what they do, you know, it's crazy. And then, actually, again, what we see is an evolution for the assisted driving. And camera and LiDAR comes back into the air again, right? So. It is per starting to pervade a little bit our lives. And where does this come into the, to, to, to this arena? Well, OK, this is a bit of history. But uh, you know, EMST actually started quite a long time work, uh, working in, uh, ago, working on imagers. And it was uh, uh, through the acquisition of a company in, uh, in Edinburgh that developed this, this camera, right? So it was a toy. It was a toy that required no uh, High image quality, you know, was just uh, part become very topical now. Um, and it was through this that then, uh, you know, Nokia uh, decided, well, okay, you know, there's these uh, very cheap things, you know, these sensors, you know, can be make, made in CMOS. How about we put it in a phone? And everybody went, no, that's never going to work. You know, you can't have cameras in phones, it's impossible. And this was one of the first ones, you know, like, you had a camera here, quite a big thing, because it had to host a massive module. You know, the, the, the size of a camera module at the time was enormous. And uh, it hadn't, there was no other sensor really in here. There was just very few. So that's what we had there. And then, you know, but uh, after Nokia, you know, like they, they were the first ones, but then, you know, they, they were uh, Sony and uh, Samsung, they came into the industry and they just basically took over the market. And, uh, and Nokia went down, and we had to think about something else, right? We couldn't compete really with Samsung and, uh, and Sony at that level, you know, they, they're too big. So we started with the time of flight ranging, right? And that's where I, I joined, pretty much was not long after I joined ST. So I was there at the right time, because, you know, before, before a product is started, there's about four years of R&D, or even longer, uh, you know, before you can get into something that is actually sellable. And now we are here, you know, we are up here. We had two billion units there and so on. And, but you know, this is where we are. Now, I spoke a lot about a LiDAR camera. Do you know what a LiDAR camera is? Somebody does try to think about? Yes? For sensing light to power right? Sorry? Let's for sensing to power and the um, distance. Yes. Yeah, so it is, I mean, the, the actual definition of it is a light detection and ranging. So it senses the distance of, of objects. And the name actually comes from, you know, a, a modification of the radar, radar name, where instead of radio, you have light, okay? And basically what it does is it, uh, it really uses basically light, sends, it, sends some uh, photons towards a target, and then we, we read them back, we read uh, and, and we, we are able to, from the distance, from the time it takes, uh, we are able to, to establish the distance. And this is a very simple um, equation. You know, we know the speed of light, so it's easy to uh, in infer the distance from measuring the time. Okay? And, but, you know, we are dealing with very small times. You know, if you think about one meter, it's about, uh, you know, time of 6.7 nanoseconds. It's quite a small, small time. And, uh, and then, you know, we talk about error, and actually, you know, if we want a small error, only a millimeter, then, you know, we have to be able to have a resolution of seven, seven picoseconds, so it's really small. Okay, and um, 
so now the, there are two main characteristics and you know if you think about so we call it a lidar camera and so we talk about pixels and the two main characteristics are to be able to sense the light uh, you know to take that photons in and give a signal output and then also to measure the arrival the the, the time of arrival of uh, of your pulses you know you have to be able to really tell how far these objects are and to use the, to do this we need the pixel so the pixel is a, the fundamental element of uh, of these devices and what you have here is uh, basically you know a spad a spad is a single photon avalanche uh, diode and uh, it's uh, it's su substantially a photon uh, a photodiode sorry held in reverse bias and when it's here is you know when you put it in uh, in reverse bias beyond the breakdown voltage it stays in an unstable equilibrium but it's in equilibrium so nothing happens until you hit it with a photon and then uh, you know an avalanche like this one you know you've got lots of electrons that go everywhere and so you're able to to detect a very su substantial avalanche uh, current coming out of your device and what is important is that that, time, that current is very well uh, timed with the arrival of the photon. So all of these, all of these avalanche buildup and so on, takes uh, picoseconds. You know, it's super fast. So you, it's very, it's really something instantaneous. And um, and so what we have as uh, you know from the spot pixel, we have basically two outputs substantially. You know, uh, time of arrival and intensity. So. How does it work? So, you know, we're talking about circuits, so I thought to put in a little bit of uh, circuit diagrams just to keep it uh, uh, relevant. Uh, so, a spot is a photodiode, but it needs, it needs some electronics uh, around it to actually take, you know, the signal from it and transform it in something that we can use. And the way we do it is we, we apply, well, okay, when we are at zero volts, I said nothing happens, you know, there's nothing there, no current, no, no voltage anywhere, you know, nothing happens. But as soon as we put it, uh, you know, to high voltage, and here it's, a, it's an IV of a standard diode, you know, you all know this, right? And uh, we put it beyond that. And as I said, you know, at the beginning, everything is quiet, there's nothing happening. So it's a, it's a very, well, uh, kind of, you know, it's, a, it's an equilibrium status. But then, as soon as a photon happens, what happens is we have, we really run from here, we, we move straight onto our IV curve where we have this, uh, this large current, and it's very detectable. And then we see the anode voltage that starts to, to go up, you know, and, uh, and again, you know, there's a um, the anode voltage, voltage goes up, but it goes up very fast, right? And that is because what we are doing is we are charging this capacitor which is a capacitor that is not visible, in fact, in our circuit. You know, it's not being put there on purpose. It is part of our, uh, of our you know, circuit uh, layout, design, implementation, you know, everything that happens here, so it's called parasitic. So parasitic are actually the most important part of, uh, of our SPAD because they do allow us to have a very fast rise time of that current because the, the capacitance is the fastest charge, chargeable element, okay? So it really goes super quick, you know, you have all this current that flows, and, you, you know, and that at the same time also trigger uh, the, 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 this kind of uh, output stage, and so your SPAD output goes down uh, at the same time, pretty much. And, um, and then what happens is you reach a point in your IV curve where you have no more current flowing, and so everything stops, you know, your current stops, you know, you don't have any more voltage increase, and the, ch the capacitance starts discharging through this resistor. So we saw from Adi that, you know, you can approximate a, a, a transistor with a, with a resistor, and that's what happens. So you have your typical RC discharge uh, kind of curve. And uh, so I go a little bit more into this, uh, this circuit. So, you know, it's quite, there's much more than just the SPAD, as I said. So what we have is, um, is the, the device, okay, the diode there with the high voltage. Then we have also this, this transistor that does act as a resistor. And actually it's very important that we have it there because it, and um, what we use it also, um, you know, we use this um, gate voltage to actually change the, the resistivity of it. So we use it as a, as a tunable resistor, and so we can change a little bit the characteristics of that uh, output pulse and that transient. And then we also have a disabling um, PMOS, so that you know when uh, when you disable the so when you enable this transistor, basically your anode 
goes up here. And so the, the delta V across your, uh, your spot becomes, goes below the breakdown. And so it doesn't, uh, it doesn't react. And we need to do this because our some of devices are maybe defective. So you want to switch them off. Or we want to do a dynamic enabling. But I'll explain to you later about all of this uh, complexity. And then finally, we have the output stage. So if you, if you look at it, it's a little bit like an inverter. So you have the NMOS and the PMOS. But then you also have some enabling. So you can disable just the output um, signal. So, and, and, that's, uh, and then what comes out here is really a true digital pulse. Okay, and what we we have uh, as an outside as an outcome from this is uh, you know if you look at it from a, on an oscilloscope, what you see is that uh, you know you have some some pulses coming out, and it's very difficult different from a stand, uh, standard photodiode. You know, standard photodiode, you know the output, um, so the the output is uh, is representative of the amount of illumination by the current, you know, so the current is a, is a direct representation of your, of your illumination uh, intensity, right? Whereas what we have here is basically something that is a, is a number of counts. So as you can see here, you know, like at the beginning, you have low intensity, very few, then you increase, you have more counts on your oscilloscope, and then you have loads, right? So what we need to think about is the intensity is really the count rate, the counts per second of our device. And so then, um, how do you come into here, right? So for me, it's, uh, you know, as an electronic engineer, really, the design of this uh, circuit. Okay, we've, uh, we've done, I showed you there uh, one example that we have, but actually you can build complexity into it. There's a lot more that you can do with it. You know, you can do a, a recharge, uh, you know, feedback loop. So you can you can do an active uh, switching off of your SPAD. So there's a lot of clever, rule, you know, uh, development of that design that you can you can implement. So uh, and and these are all electronics engineers. You know, the pixel and the and the circuit. You know, they are they're all electronics engineer jobs. Now going back to our pixel. Uh, um, but I picked two figure merits that are really specific to this part of the of the pixel, and one is the power, and the other one is the count rate. So the the ability to to measure a high intensity signal. Okay, so it's a, your dynamic range if you if you want to think about it that way. And so the first one is really about power consumption of the chip, right? If you think about the number of sensors that are in one car, in one phone. If you can reduce the power of each of them substantially, then you're winning, okay? Especially now, you know, the portable devices are becoming smaller and smaller. We have, you know, sensors everywhere. IoT, you know, is, uh, is taking sensors everywhere. So you want to really reduce the impact that has on the Earth, you know, on, on our overall power consumption as human beings. And then we have the maximum count rate. And again, we want to increase that to the, you know, to high level because we want to be able to, to measure those high signal rates. And so to do this, actually, we go back. The well, first thing is uh, we look at the power pixel. And you know, if we look back at our pixel um, output uh, pulse, what we want to do is to reduce it. You know, we want to reduce its amplitude. So it's, uh, it's this kind of part of the, of the um, output uh, anode voltage uh, characteristic. And so the, the amplitude is really determined by Vx. So it's that excess bias above uh, breakdown, because it's where this stops you know, your spot stops uh, kind of having current through it. But then it's also about the, the current, you know, this, car, this, this capacitance here. So it's about how fast, how fast this goes up, you know, so that really broads current. So it's, uh, you know, power is uh, IV, so, you know, the current becomes very important. So that capacitance, that thing that we don't see has to be minimized, right? And it's, uh, it's a difficult one to do because it's not visible. So you have to really think about all your components, you know, your SPAD, all your layout, all your circuitry around there to have minimal capacitance, you know, in terms of uh, parasitic uh, elements. And unfortunately, when you look at, uh, you know, your DRC manual, you know, it's gigantic, it doesn't tell you about the parasitic element inside your, uh, you know, your wire and, and all of this stuff. So, yeah, it's, it's a difficult one to challenge, but it's a challenge that, you know, we, we take on. The other one is the maximum count rate. So again, you know, we look at the SPAD output. So we need to think about, you know, we want to reduce that pulse width, that part of the the the, um, the, 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 the circuit where you know you're looking at 
uh, for how much your spot is, uh, is not able to recharge, you know, to restart. And to do this, okay, we go back to our nanode voltage, we look at the RC discharge, you know, it's a, it's a standard thing. So again, it's the capacitance, it's an evil thing, but there is also the resistance. So what we want to do here is reduce both of them. Okay, so the, the resistance is easy, you know, you tune that uh, uh, transistor and it's, uh, it's okay. Uh, but the capacitor is a bit of a tricky one. But then, you know, we want to reduce the resistance, but we have to be very careful. Because even that one, you know, you reach a point where if you reduce it too much, then your current flows through the resistor and you have no capacitance charges, so you, you're, you're lost. So you've lost your output altogether. So there's always a trade-off, you know, and that's part of uh, what an engineering job is, is really to try to resolve all these problems and use the intuition to decide how to do it the best way. So now, the pixel implementation is quite a, a big uh, job, you know, like you have to think about, okay, so this is nice, you know, but I have to, think, to do something which fits a product, right? It fits also, you know, the, the product requirements. So, you know, you don't want to have your phone that then stops working after two days because the, the, the sensor has died or, you know, it's gone into short. So, it doesn't. so you have to guarantee five years performance and so on. And so to do this, actually, what we, you know, I always like uh, to compare myself to a cake, you know, a baker. You know, you've seen now all these bake-off, uh, you know, shows and so on. So we start off with, uh, you know, the little drawing of how beautiful your, your cake will look, you know, fantastic. So you take basically from the customer, and those, the, the customer is intended both the person outside of the company or the person inside. So it could be our marketing uh, department or our product development uh, team, right? And they say, okay, I want that, you know, taste, color, size, pretty much it's the same, you know, you, that's what we want for the SPAD. Um, then we go and we draw the shape, right? We do a lot of layout. And again, you know, think about the, the parasitics. Layout is, a, is very important. Understanding what it means to place a transistor in a position rather than another one is very key. And actually, when you look at the SPAD, uh, the SPAD pixel, even, you know, how you put your layers near each other, you know, how far you put them and so on. Do you make a working device or do you make something which is catastrophically horrible? So, and we have teams of, uh, you know, engineers that actually really work the detail, you know, in detail on this. And we also have, um, you know, deciding it is ingredients, the ingredients, so all these processes, and we use simulation tools. So we use something called TCAT, so this is a kind of an example. And you look at all the recipe, you know, does it work, does it not work, you bake it and so on. And then what comes out is, uh, you know, we put it in an oven, and actually, you know, a, a fab furnace is an oven, right? So it's a, it's a bit bigger than the one you have in the house, but uh, it's the same thing. And uh, we make the diodes, you know, we, we basically make them, and then uh, we need to taste them. You know, do they perform as we want them, or should we throw them in the bin? And, uh, and all of this is done by, by teams, right? And again, all of these teams are electronics engineers. And so bear this in mind when you think about, okay, what is that your dream job? So there's a lot here that can, uh, can come into play. But finally, you know, okay, we got this part output, but you know, we're not yet sensing distance. You know, what we need to really think about, okay, where, where does, does this go? You know, what do you do with a pixel? And actually, again, you know, we need to measure this distance. We need to measure this time. So we need to measure, we need to have an emitter and a sensor. And to, this, to do this, we create something this complicated, right? It's a, an enormous box. Actually, it's not enormous because I have it here and it's tiny. See this like, tiny little thing that you can barely, so I'll, uh, I'll actually pass it through you. And you can see how small one of these uh, sensors is, right? It's a little black box there. Right, and it has all of these uh, elements, okay? So what it has is uh, the sensor. So this is your chip, right? Then you have a substrate. So that is really to make sure that you can interface your chip with the rest of the world. So you never have uh, pure silicon, you know, even if you have a memory, you know, it's always encapsulated into something to, to the interface. And it's also got some uh, thermal uh, properties and so on, so to make sure that you know, nothing goes too hot and melts and whatever. Then what you have is the laser source, right? And what, what we, we use what we call Vexel. So it's a vertical 
cavity surface emitting laser. And it's a very particular, very small piece of silicon that is, uh, is well, no, it's not silicon, it's some other material, um, gallium, something. And, uh, and basically, that's your, your laser. And then you have some optical elements, so you need to really think about where you're throwing your, your photons. Then you have something coming back. So again, some uh, more optical elements. And then finally, your, uh, your, your SPAD pixel. So you know, it's, a, it's a small part of a very big system. And then you also need something to actually give you a reference. Because uh, when, what happens is that when you have temperature drifting, you know, if you're in a hot room, your, uh, your, your laser you know, timing will shift somewhere. Your, uh, you know, everything moves a little bit, you know, the wavelengths and so on. And so there's a lot of things that change from the environment perspective. And so what you need is, you know, really to measure the distance between these two um, kind of, uh, ref you know, the reference and the, the pixel array. So it's, it's both um, laser returns and you do a subtraction between the two. So now, what are the challenges? So why did we have to build such a complicated system? You know, was it not just easy enough to put, uh, you know, a spot there and, uh, you know, a laser? It would be enough, right? But actually, it isn't. Because, uh, so if we look at a target, right, which is about five meters away, we have our, uh, you know, module there. We throw one quadrillion of photons, right, to the surface. Uh, sorry, to the surface. And what happens is, the light coming back, actually, it's not coming back. We don't have a retro reflector there, right? So it's not coming back to us. It's going, it's going back to everywhere in, uh, you know, in your environment. And, um, and in fact, you know, normally a target is, uh, is called Lambertian. So each point uh, that reflects, reflects in all directions. So it's, uh, you know, normally this is the, the, the surface. Unless it's a mirror, it's the way it behaves. And so if we take into account, you know, the average target reflectivity, the, the, the average sensor sensitivity or whatever we have in our sensor and so on, what happens is at the end we have one signal event received per pulse, right? Per quadrillion of photons emitted. Is that one photon? Yes. Well, no, it's one event, so it's, you also take into account uh, the probability of a photon hitting the, the spad and then the spad emitting a, a, a pulse. So it's a one event. So it's what you're dealing with uh, in terms of yeah, everything that uh, yeah, you take into account also the, the spot sensitivity. And so the best thing, so the first thing you do is, okay, let's say, okay, we have 90 degrees. Well, let's shrink that down. So we build all these uh, complex modules and so on. We add lenses and we shrink it down to 30 degrees, right? First thing, simple geometry, easy, you know, but quite, uh, quite affordable. And, uh, you know, but we employ a lot of mechanical engineers and optical engineers to resolve this problem and make it in a very form, uh, small format. Because we want a small module, you know, we want small uh, height. So we can't just use a lens of the shelf, you know. You saw this, uh, you know, the size of this thing, you know, that was the size of a lens, uh, you know, it was mainly the size of the lens of the, in front of the camera. So we've actually did quite a lot of evolution of this. And uh, now we use uh, what we call diffractive opti optics, where you can just basically put a lens in front of a, you know, you basically deposit some nitride in, on a glass, and you do all these, uh, all, you know, uh, lens uh, properties. So then the other thing, okay, is uh, that's not enough. Let's increase the sensitivity. So instead of using a single, a single spot, what we do is we call this macro pixel. So we put all the spots together. We put, uh, in this case, okay, let's say 16 of them together. Still with their quenching circuit, so it has to be all, uh, you know, um, laid out perfectly well, so that you have the same distance for each of your uh, of your output, you know, of, your, of each spad has to take the same distance to reach the the logic, right? Because if you have any dis difference in uh, in the layout, then something arrives earlier, something arrives later, so it's a nightmare. So again, quite a lot of work in uh, in distributing all these signals. And then the other thing is, okay, so now we have 16, and we need to kind of using them somehow and, uh, you know, putting them together so we use an OR tree. Okay, so you say, okay, fine, that's, that's it, solved, the problem is perfect, all good, you have all these uh, signals put, put together, perfect. 
But actually, you know, the reality is that the ideal situation would be that we were in, uh, you know, we all worked uh, always at night time and go around and do all these uh, time of flight sensing in, the, in darkness or in a, in a dark room like today. But actually the reality is that you need to work with them outside, right? So instead of having this beautiful <coughs> scenario where you have your beautiful, you know, pulses coming back to you, you have something that looks more like this. And you just go, okay, where, where is my signal? It's impossible to find. So, okay, so then, um, you know, let's focus a little bit on the, on the sun, right? So we are, in, we are outside, so this is the spectrum of the sun, okay? And um, there are two, you know, we, start, we have to think about, okay, so ideally, actually, you know, we're using silicon, so the best place to use silicon in is here, right? So you want to be, because uh, somehow, the silicon maximum sensitivity corresponds to our eyes maximum sensitivity. Right, so it's visible. So it's perfect for cameras, right? But you know, if you need laser, then be careful because uh, you need uh, to make sure that you're not blasting people with laser, you know, high power laser in their eyes because otherwise you'll just become blind. So we can't work in the invisible. It's impossible, right? And uh, you know, our customers also said, well, you know, you have to make sure that that thing is not visible by anybody, right? So nobody wants to see some light being shine, shown at them, and or, you know, a red dot coming out of your phone, you know, it's, it's not, play, you know, nobody wants that, it's scary, right? So, luckily, we saw that there is a little dip here in, this, in the solar spectrum, and it's a 940 nanometer <laughs> where you cannot see anything, so in fact, if you look at your phone, you never see anything red, but if you look at it with an infrared camera, you will see that your phone emits a light. Okay, so you can see that. And uh, actually, wait a second. Um, and uh, uh, the other, the other uh, property is that it's, um, what did I say? Yeah, so it's, it, uh, it is beautiful here, you know, because it's, uh, it's high safe uh, and there is this, uh, this, ga this uh, reduction in, uh, in solar radiation, so it's very good. So what we did is, okay, let's start using this uh, laser at 940 nanometer. And this actually created quite a lot of uh, boom in that, in that um, uh, technology because nobody really wanted to work here. You know, there wasn't really application, but with this one, it became quite a popular wavelength. And then we also have to add uh, infrared filters. So these are bandpass filter that are optical uh, to make sure that your emission is only there and you only measure the light that comes back at that wavelength. Okay, you still have, unfortunately, some background leaking through. I mean, you know, that's inevitable. You have some noise from your sensor anyway. You know, the spot is, uh, has got some dark current, so you have some, some noise here and so on. So then what we have is, okay, let's go back to our uh, ore tree, right? We're still having quite a large, quite a fast throughput, you know, a lot of signals coming through. So we need to think about, okay, what do we do for, uh, you know, if we look at it, uh, we see that if there is a spot firing, right, it uh, stays, you know, the output is on for 10 seconds and then comes down, then the second spot is firing, 10 seconds. But what happens at the ore tree output is that you have a very long pulse coming out. So effectively, you're measuring only one photon even if you have had two, or, you know, one event, even if you had two events effectively uh, hitting that macro pixel. And so what we came up with was this uh, pulse shaper. So the pulse shaper is a circuit that actually basically shrinks down your output of your, of your SPAD and makes it only on one nanosecond long. So then, you know, the throughput to your, to your R3, R3 is much better. You know, you can really see all the individual, uh, the individual pulses. And again, we had to squeeze that somewhere in the, in the layout. And again, the layout really is, uh, is something that is very critical. And I think, you know, it's important that we always bear in mind that actually, you know, circuit is not just the circuit design, it's also how you put it together, okay? And for us, it's also very important because, uh, you know, any of this area is wasted, right? If you talk about sensitivity, right, any logic element that you add to your pixel, you are basically losing, losing that sensitivity that you're trying to increase. So you have to make sure that what you do is really minimal size, again, trying to make uh, you know, everything work, but with, uh, with a lot of constraints. So then the next, uh, the next uh, problem that we had was uh, you know, looking at the, the scene. Okay, you don't have just one object, 
right? Or you know, if you only use one object, then you know, if you have many objects uh, and you um, you just basically take an, an average of your ink, you know, of your light coming in, uh, in terms of timing, then you know, you will maybe focus somewhere halfway, so, you know, in between the, the crowd and so on, because you have an average of all the signal. So what that created was the need to create to, to have histogramming. Okay, and actually histogram, in a histogram, each bin along here represents a time slot at which we have a, uh, an event, okay? And, uh, and so when we have this type of system, we, have, we, can, we are able to detect each individual target in our, uh, in our environment. And then, okay, you can also think about it, okay, there's the one, the, the kind of the depth, uh, histogramming, then there's a, the kind of the overall uh, scene, so you have various uh, special items as well. But uh, actually, you know, it's a very high amount of data and power that we have to deal with now. You know, it's quite a, it's quite a lot, because if you think about every time there is a photon coming back, you're, you're actually detecting that, you're storing it, and then it's only at the end when you've captured all the, the elements of your histogram that then you analyze it. And it's very powerful because it gives you, you know, you can do a lot of uh, signal processing on that one. You know, you can uh, evaluate the, the, the kind of the um, reflectivity of your object. So infer sometimes the material it's made of, because you know your wavelength. Uh, you can infer, uh, you know, you can really reconstruct. Sometimes, you know, we've seen recently there's been a lot of work on uh, just reconstructing a whole scene from one pixel looking at the histogram. If you use artificial intelligence and you train your sensor to know that a histogram corresponds to, you know, a specific, uh, you know, object, then you can do that as well. You know, so histogram is very powerful, but it does uh, it does come with a with a very expensive uh, cost of data and power. So what we end up in with is, uh, is something a bit like that. You know, all these elements actually have to be put on silicon. And so we have a Vexel driver, which I think is this guy here. Then we have your uh, return spot array, your reference one, which is much smaller. You know, it's got a lot of signal coming through. And then you, you have the histogramming, which I think is all of this uh, logic here, which is, looks very, very uniform. Then you have some uh, uh, high voltage generation, which I think is, uh, is about here, some charge pumps. And then, uh, okay, there's, a, there's some clever, you know, there's a microcontroller, there's a full uh, processing of the histogram, and uh, you can do um, some, some autonomous ranging. And, uh, and, you know, from this guy, you can actually have some different, uh, you, can, you can select basically what you want to do, you know, whether you want to have a rough, uh, spatial uh, information, you know, of your scene, if it's a very simple scene, or whether you want to have a larger resolution. I mean, ideally, you saw recently uh, there was a, li an I a LiDAR um, sensor in the phone uh, from Sony, and that is, uh, you know, has a big resolution, you know, it's a true camera, so it's, it's, a, it's a big sensor. And again, so, you know, and that really brings us back to, to why we created this very complex system. You know, it's because there's a lot of um, constraints that you have to deal with. And actually, and it doesn't end here, right? There's a lot, of more, a lot more that comes into play when you develop a product. You know, it's a, there's a lot of, so as I said, we have the pixel uh, development, so several teams in there. Then we have the um, silicon design teams, and again, that's a lot of uh, a lot of teams. So we have digital, uh, analog, um, and then there's a, a kind of a DPI. So it's a, it's quite a lot of different teams that come together to to put that silicon, and then you have to make it. So in the manufacturing side, again, uh, you know you do the production, so several months there, and then you need to test it. So we have to test all the chips that come out of our fab. So in a, I didn't bring a wafer because traveling is a bit difficult, but if you think about a, a wafer, which is about this size, it's a 30 centimeter diameter, so it's quite a big one. Uh, for those devices that you have there, there's about 30,000 on them, and we have to test all of them. So you have to really work on something which is fast. Every millisecond spent on testing is a cost. So you want to be efficient, you want to, be, to know what you're measuring and try to do it quickly. 
So there's a lot of engineering that goes into that. Then we, we have uh, on, uh, in parallel the, the, the module design, so what I showed you, you know, about all this kind of encasing and so on. And then there's the assembly. Again, assembly line, all automated, you know, all the, the kind of the, the, all the instrumentation that comes into, you know, mounting things together, putting them together and, uh, you know, bonding and so on. It's all automated. So there's a lot of electronics engineering going in behind that. We design all our uh, tests, rigs uh, and assembly rigs in-house. So it's, uh, it's a lot. And then finally, again, we assemble everything, right? And then we still have to test it again. Because uh, you know, in the process, you might have had a little bit of dust uh, ending up on the sensor, so it doesn't work anymore. Or you know, your vexel is uh, is a bit uh, out of spec, so you know it doesn't emit anything. So you need to make sure that what you sell to your customer is a perfectly working device. Okay, that lasts uh, at least as long as the phone. So you have to guarantee it for five years. I think it's uh, it's a time. And then you know, okay, you're still you you have to deal with the customers. Right? So you have to give them something that is easy to use. So you have software and, uh, and customer support. So customer support is called application teams. So there are people that actually develop all that kind of uh, interface for the users to be able to use the, the, the system as they want. Right? So there's a lot of, of, uh, of people going in there. And, um, Yes, and so what comes out of it is uh, something like that. I wanted a video, but I didn't manage to get one. But basically, that's what you get is, uh, is basically a, um, a scene which has, uh, okay, this is basically a sensor put very close to a, a, a digital camera, standard camera. And you can see basically that you can uh, detect the distance of the hand, so in red, a very close object, and then the distance of the ceiling when it's close enough. Otherwise, uh, you know, we just guarantee, a, for this guy, it's a range of about three meters, so everything that is away, further away than three meters, we, we just don't measure it. And then um, we also have gesture, so it's able to recognize whether you're doing this, whether you're doing that. So it's also able to recognize some specific uh, gestures that, uh, that are in, inserted in the in the system, and again, so what I said is uh, okay. That's possible jobs for the future. You know, the analog design is one of them, and actually, is one of the ones that we need the most because there are no <coughs> analog designers available anymore. But there are other things that you can do. So you know, there's a there's yes. a lot of other opportunities. And uh, again, a little bit of advertising. You know, the, just to tell you where we are. I mean, okay, so but. How good are we are making these devices? Well, we are decent. We have managed to ship two billion units. So that's quite a lot of uh, a lot of things. And actually, again, what I wanted to say is, we have all our marketing. Well, the majority of our marketing people are electronics engineers, right? They de they decided that actually going out and talking about the sensor and really you know selling them was uh, was what they like to do most. So you know, even what you do at, at the moment is something very technical. In the future, you might decide to do something a bit different. So you know, don't don't keep yourself uh, limited. And also applications. Okay, we see it in many applications. I mean, we we have these uh, available on the mass market. So what it means is that you know people see what it does, you know how it works, and then they use it for something that they've come up with, you know their ideas. And we have it in laptops, uh, you know robots, you know the cleaning robots that now many people have in their houses because we are all too busy or too lazy to do cleaning, and uh, you know so that's fantastic. And then. As I say, many, many other things that you can see. I mean, vending machines, you know those things where you have always the, the crisps stuck, that they don't come down. Like, so uh, those ones actually employ, deploy our sensors to know, you know, whether the, you know, how many parts are left, you know, whether it's time to restock or not, and so on. So this is, um, this is where we are. And then, OK, you know, I said, uh, what's, what's to come? And uh, where we are today, is uh, you know something in technology, so I thought to go a little bit here. You know, we talk about I showed you today something which is monolithic, so it's all designed in a 2D silicon. So you only have one one uh, technology node. So in this case, it was a 40 nanometer um, MOS minimum size. But uh, you know, the the processes are progressing a lot. You know, the technology is progressing massively, and what we see is now, you know, the appearance. Well, we have a very well established two two layer stacking, so that means that you have the ability to completely, um, what do you say, uh, 
so keep one, one wafer completely standard. So you have your standard logic. But then uh, you create a dedicated process on the other wafer, which are not compatible with CMOS necessarily. I mean, they're compatible with the fab, so they still use the traditional processes, but they require maybe some baking that is not good for a, for a transistor and so on. So you want to have dedicated processes, especially when you talk about pixels. I mean, you really need to go away from, from what is the digital uh, constraints, because the digital process has a, has a lot of constraints you know, in terms of, uh, of how you do the baking and, uh, and what uh, recipes you put in there. So this is really something that has, uh, has made us uh, progress enormously towards something that is, uh, is able to have very good logic, very small logic nodes. You know, we, we, we're hearing this morning, you know, the sizes of the logic nodes now are tiny. You know, so you can pack in a lot of, uh, a lot of you know, intelligence in there. You know, we talk about the artificial intelligence, you know, having a, digi a dedicated logic node means that you c can pack things in. And keeping your pixel matrix still best performing because, uh, you know, you still need to be able to collect all those photons. You know, it's, uh, it's again one of the things that we want to do. And what we see coming up now is a three-layer stacking, right? This is mind-blowing. And, uh, and again, it's, uh, it gives a, actually for the analog designers, it's the best, <coughs> the most fun thing. Because what you do is you have your top tier, which is only sensing, right? So it's really just the photodiode. Then you have all those analog uh, little components that go just after you know, your pixel. And that is valid both for cameras and spads. So both, both for your traditional integrating pixel. And you can design your, log, your, uh, your readout using pure analog components with less restrictions or the maximum voltage that you can use to read out on, your, you know, on how big your, your devices are and so on. And then you have the advanced CMOS. You have those three nano, nanometer kind of logic that you can really take advantage of. Okay, so this is what you will be working with when you go into industry, right? It's fantastic, absolutely. And um, okay, so we started off from the Barbie cam, right, in the 90s. We, are, we saw Nokia, you know, in 2009, 10 years later, pretty much, having the first, uh, you know, the cameras. I think uh, they reached uh, 500 million units for us was, uh, you know, 2009. Now we have uh, the iPhone, and then what's next? Right? Where are you coming in to, to kind of give us the next idea, right? And just to, to kind of show you where, you know, tan, you know, in a tangible way, just not to open, leave it open, is uh, we're looking at doing sustainable design, okay? And what that mean is looking at, you know, developing process using less material, less water. So, you know, the, the process I showed you, you know, uses a lot of, uh, of earth components, you know, all things that are taken out of our earth. So how can you do it better, more efficiently? Okay, there's a lot of work that is now going into this. Same for design. I mean, it's a big challenge to, you know, to reduce voltages. I mean, reduce power consumption of your things. It's, it's not trivial, right? You don't, you don't get the same performance. Uh, when you when you reduce the voltages, it's it's much more complicated to work in there and requires a lot more innovation. So this is really where you can really strike uh, success. And um, and then there's the artificial intelligence. I mean, we hear this all the time. You know, everybody's scared by it, but actually, what it can bring is the efficiency and the security. So you can, if you can embed artificial intelligence on chips then you can have more chips, more secure chips, much more, much less data transfer from your chip to the external world, have more kind of on-chip on functionality. And this again is for power consumption and, uh, and kind of sustainability in the long term. The other thing is about the product. You know, we talked about, uh, again, the <coughs> encapsulating material. You know, can you improve on that? Uh, test time. That's again, it's cost. It's cost, but it's cost for the earth, for, for the energy, the power that is put into there, you know, the consumption. And, um, you know, can, what can we do there? And also, you know, can we improve the, the technique and the, the kind of the construction of the, me the methodology really to improve? So for me, there's so much still that we can, uh, we can, con we can improve on. And the applications, I showed you some of the applications, you know, the robot, the robot and so on. But, you know, what's coming is we see augmented reality. 
you know, I don't know how far you are from wearing goggles. I mean, I, for me, it's still completely crazy. But, you know, it's a bit like the story of the Nokia that, uh, you know, you, you, nobody believed in it. But, you know, we see, go we see even glasses now, you know, like starting to become, you know, these virtual glasses and, and so on, you know, like crazy. Um, and, uh, you know, we're also seeing proliferation of things like this, you know, these kind of uh, Fitbit things and, and so on. You know, people are starting to wanting to check their health, you know, on a, on a continuous basis. So, you know, can, what, what is coming after is something that is a story for you to write. Okay, what is the other, the, what is the next thing? And okay, just another thing is that I think is very important, you know, because I really believe in this is really the, commit, the commitment to be carbon neutral. And I think it's, uh, it's something that we all should strive for. Every design that we do has to take this into account, right? Because the situation is quite um, daring. And uh, finally, I would like to thank all the people that helped me to put this slide together and the teams that, uh, you know, worked on this. You know, they did a great job. And, um, and without them, you know, as a single individual, you cannot do anything. So working in teams and collaborating is, uh, is fantastic. Okay, thank you very much. Have time for discussion. Uh, any questions? Please. Okay, I have a, <coughs> I have a bit of a uh, multi part question uh, regarding the V cell inside of the sensor. Nice. Right. Uh, we, we were talking about uh, how temperature can affect the way the V-cell uh, works. Yeah. Uh, how exactly do you, I think you, you, you spoke about it, but I didn't catch it. Uh, how do you counter the effects that the temperature have on the, on the, emit, on the laser emitter? So, okay, so there are, there's one effect, which is the temperature. Uh, so, sorry. One effect is the emission uh, wavelength. So that shifts. So what we do is we account to allow a little bit wider bandwidth. So instead of, you know, like we, we normally have, um, I think, uh, 10 to 15 nanometer bandwidth for the, for the laser so that we account for the full temperature range of our sensors. So normally sensors have to be um, compatible to minus 40 to 80 degrees for to be operation minus 40 to, to 80 yes for operational so you have to make sure that you know your band your bandpass filter uh, allows for that for that shift the other one is temperature so it the other one for temperature is the intensity so again you have to, you have to be careful that you can maybe adjust your driving uh, current so that you keep an intensity which is not so temperature uh, sensitive and the other the other problem with temperature is that your overall uh, timing shifts so that's why you cannot, you know, between the driver and the, and the receiver. So you cannot use the driver uh, pulse as your reference because the, the timing shift uh, with temperature is not the same. So what you do is you create this uh, optical reference, uh, you know, with the reference, the little uh, pulse that stays inside the cavity so that then you can, uh, you know, the two, the two optical sensors have exactly the same temperature shift. Which is not the case for the driver of the of the vessel. The uh, the other question is uh, we're using laser, we're using lasers, so we're talking about radiation, right? Yes. Uh, how exactly, or how much, what type of radiation would influence uh, the sensor itself? You mean electromagnetic would, radiations? Are those the types that would affect it? The only ones? So okay. So what you have is, uh, for example, you might have. Uh, things like interference. So what you need to do is to make sure that, uh, you know, you, you check that what you're uh, receiving is the same, is the same uh, pulse that you emitted, right? So there's, uh, there's methods of uh, maybe frequency modulation and so on where you, you basically look at various, uh, you know, you check that when you change frequency that, that you're detecting changes equally. Um, and then there's, a, there's other interference like electromagnetic, but we do specific tests for that and we make sure that, uh, you know, you're not uh, interfering with those, you know, like when you're working with a phone, you always have to make sure that you're not interfering with any of that. So you work at a band, you know, at, that uh, is, uh, is compatible with all the EMC system. 
electromagnetic. But there is no way that the uh, the radiation itself, so the electromagnetic uh, radiation, interferes whatsoever to the point that, for example, if I put my hand close to the sensor, it doesn't detect the hand whatsoever. So okay, uh, when you when you have a very close target, you have a different problem. So that uh, usually it's not a problem of. Um, electromagnetic interference in that case, it's that maybe you have too high a signal. So if you put your hand too close, uh, you have saturation effects uh, and so on. But you, it's not, uh, you know, you're always detecting the light is coming back from your hand. You know, it's always the one that you've emitted. So in that case, you don't, you know, you are, as a person don't, don't have any interference. Also, just the last question then. Um, <laughs> oh, there's different types of, uh, of sensors, but uh, what's the standard uh, range of these sensors? So we're talking about sensors that can detect oh, the distance, right? So what's the maximum distance considering the wavelength that we're using? Okay, so for, for these type of devices, we say five meters, because they're usually for indoor. But then it's a question of how do you design your optics? Because you know, there's a, the LiDAR for cars are you know, hundreds of meters. So you know, I think the 200 meters is uh, pretty much the maximum range for those ones, but they do have a much more complicated optical uh, encapsulation um, that is designed by the, the the manufacturer of that sensor. You know, there's, we sell the you know, for example, we make the silicon for those, but then the design of that uh, overall package uh, is uh, is done externally. So yeah, so but it depends really on the optical uh, element that you put there, where you know where your laser is. So that is what matters. And so you can have something much bigger that allows you to, to have a, a beam which is very, very narrow and pretty much a collimated beam, and then you can, you can go many more meters. I mean, there's uh, some system that work at kilometers, um, you know, if you look at publication, but they use a much uh, different wavelength. They use 1550, because otherwise the attenuation is too high. So you know the atmospheric attenuation. So 1550 is usually where you get kilometers of, you know, the, what you see as uh, ranging from an, an airplane, and so on. That's usually done in the long wavelength. Thank you. You're welcome. Hello. Okay. Uh, on slide 45, you shows the you, you show the graph uh, of the wavelengths. You you kind of just uh, told him, but I was wondering, uh, there were lower dips than the one you chose, the 940 na nanometers uh, on yes. the right. And I was wondering if there are any studies on those dips, or if not, what shows you to. So in fact, uh, I mean, just well, okay, this is not quite correct, but you know, the, there is one at 1550. So all optical telecoms work at 1550. But silicon does not absorb at that wavelength. So we are really limited by the fact that you know, the, the maximum wavelength of silicon is uh, uh, 1,100, so 1,100 nanometers. And beyond that, you need to start going into uh, um, materials which are like germanium on silicon. You, know, you can have germanium uh, or ingas, but they are much more complicated to, to manufacture. And um, and so we don't really have that at the moment, you know, like for, uh, for being able to, to work with silicon, you need to stay really below here. So you, could, you couldn't catch that dip on the right? No, the 1200, for example, this one is uh, germanium. I think you can do it with germanium, but this one is ingas, really. You're into indium gallium arsenide, and it's, uh, it doesn't exist. Today, um, in silicon fab, there is no ingas. I mean, Sony has some ingas uh, detectors. You know, they have some ingas cameras, but they are, uh, they are introducing a completely different type of uh, device. And you need cooling, and so it's, it's a much more complicated system. Not, not for a mobile phone, really, today. There was another question, I think. Yes. Hello. Oh. My question is, why use li uh, LiDAR instead of like ultrasonic sensors, for example? I mean, I think it's a, it's a question of resolution and accuracy, uh, especially spatially. You know, you can uh, you have you have a better uh, ability to do a spatial resolution in, with lidar than you do in uh, sonar. Okay. 
think uh, that's any more questions? Thank you. So first of all, thank you very much for a great talk. Um, just have a question. You showed one of the slides where the pixels were shown, and I, I thought they're um, implemented at different height with respect to each other. It wasn't just one flat surface. It looks like there are the steps. I don't know if that was uh, uh, just uh, artwork or that was... So this one, uh, so the one I'm presenting here is... Uh, this no, not one, this, this one. one. The one that actually showed... Uh, the 3D uh, stacking. Yeah, uh, 3D stacking of them. Yeah, just a second. I don't know where it was, number. Yes, this one. No? Um, the one that showed the pixels, and I think it was in steps. I don't know if I have the slides, you can take a look. Um, I don't remember, because in this, uh, in this presentation, I'm only showing uh, something which is uh, monolithic. So this technology is purely monolithic. It's not... Um, I thought that was the picture of the actual pixel that had colors and had several... No, we stuff. do have... Uh, so more recently, we do have uh, some... Ah, okay, I see what you... Which I think you're referring to this... Uh, just give me a second, I'll find it. Oh, it's not. This is no. Sorry, I don't I'll, remember yeah, because sure, I'll, uh, I'll I mean the, our latest technology is with the two 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 stacked la layers, but in this presentation I didn't uh, I didn't present anything that was a uh, sorry. I will, I will check the number and I'll let you. <laughs> what was the question? Well, do you want to ask me the question anyway? I was just wondering whether when they're Implementing pixels, whether each pixel comes at a different height with respect to each other, or they're all at the same level. No, the pixels are all on the same surface. Same. Okay. Yes, yes, Thank absolutely. You. Thanks. Yes. I think maybe you were referring to this uh, picture, which is... Uh, yes. Yes, no, this is just uh, to show a 3D image. Sorry, a bit misleading. Any more? No? Okay. All right, if there are no more questions, thank you, sir. Thank you.